Okay, everybody, we are at 101 and I, I promised I wouldn't uh, wait too long to get started and as people continue to log in, so be it. Uh, welcome to Machine Metrics webinar series, uh, Equipment as a Service. Uh, it is a beautiful day uh, out in Massachusetts. I hope it is all equally gorgeous wherever you all are. Uh, we have a really good one for you today, so we're, we're really excited uh, to get started. An agenda for a quick review. Uh, we're going to just start off with the, uh, you know, a little intro spiel, uh, followed by a very brief company uh, presentations um, and introductions. Uh, then we're going to follow that with a live discussion on on our on our topic uh, and a Q and A, as well as uh, tout uh, some of the exciting things that are to come within our series. Uh, but before we get started, uh, just a couple brief notes. Uh, firstly. Um, uh, the, this webinar is being recorded and we will send out a link to the recording after the webinar, fear not. We know that people uh, sometimes have to log out early um, and you know, it's, 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 it, you will get that uh, within 24 hours or so post webinar. Um, another note, the questions are very welcome. Uh, there is a Q and A uh, area within the Zoom navigation for you to ask questions at any time. Uh, you're also welcome to talk about yourselves within uh, the uh, the chat area within within the Zoom, uh, but uh, we'll do our best to get to those questions as we go along. Sometimes we we pick them off as they come about. Um, other times uh, we'll wait till the end where we can then address them directly. Uh, so uh, while well, I close the door of my my small apartment. Um, I am your host today, Graham Ehrman, VP of Marketing at Machine Metrics. I'm uh, grateful to be here with you all. Uh, much more exciting, we have a, a great, awesome special guest uh, today, uh, Sandy D'Souza, who's Director of Strategic Alliances at FIX. Uh, you know, he's here to provide some excellent insight uh, with us on, on this great topic. Um, the last little items before we get started, uh, we are still uh, amid our COVID-19 response program, we're providing uh, free access to our platform and consulting services for any manufacturer um, affected by, uh, by, by COVID-19, um, as many of us are. Uh, please reach out uh, to us at any time. We also have a COVID-19 response website where you can learn more about uh, our program, which we'll also send out in our follow-up link. Uh, we are on June 16th, uh, we'll also be hosting uh, a webinar with our friends from Modern Machine Shop uh, called Data Democratization, Unlocking the Value of Industry 4.0. That'll be on June 16th from two to three, and I hope you are able to join us for that one as well. Um, as some of you may or may not have already seen, uh, we are going to be providing some polling questions just so we can learn more about our audience and better serve you. Uh, we, we like to take these anonymous answers, answers and, and, and do some data science on them uh, and, and provide those back to you as well. Um, so you can learn more about um, you know, the audience and the people interested and the people here today with you. So those will pop up intermittently uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so, um, so, so don't be surprised. And uh, so just to get to our first, uh, our first uh, presentation, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about machine metrics. Um, you know, machine metrics is, is accelerating manufacturing digital transformation. Uh, we provide an intuitive and flexible platform to easily collect uh, data from any piece of, of manufacturing equipment and transform that data into powerful, actionable applications uh, that reduce machine downtime, enhance legacy processes, and, and drive more throughput and, and utilization capacity with your manufacturing equipment. Right now, uh, hundreds of manufacturers have connected thousands of machines uh, to machine metrics across our global factories. And our platform is enabling these companies to deliver that, the right information to the right person at the right time so they can improve their uh, machine performance and productivity um, and ultimately uh, win more business to remain globally competitive in an ever more competitive uh, landscape. Um, the, uh, the foundation uh, of, of the machine metrics platform really is in the uh, automated capture and, and transformation um, 
of machine data. Uh, this capability enables consumable machine data uh, 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 in a matter of minutes. Uh, machine metrics largely gathers data from the control of the machine via machine metrics edge platform. Um, and, um, and, and then uh, the edge platform features dozens of, of custom software adapters uh, that are developed to automatically unlock, map out and collect and standardize available data points. Uh, anything from internal sensors to the machine to statuses, modes, alarms, overrides, loads, speed, speeds, et cetera. Um, and to provide a, a plug and play solution, our platform runs on, a, uh, on a, an edge device, uh, which our customers call the little green box, um, which uh, IoT enables machines, uh, connects directly to the modern uh, CNC machine control. Um, so that data from the machine is instantly and securely streamed to the machine metrics cloud. Um, and then we also have the ability to add additional sensors uh, to connect legacy equipment or additional sensors required for, for deeper data um, analysis. Um, that data, uh, our multi-tenant cloud is, is, is where kind of where the magic happens. Uh, uh, it's uniquely optimized for machine data ingestion, um, enabling instant analytics and insights on top of that data, including machine performance and condition monitoring and reporting, um, as well as extensibility in other systems through APIs, BI integrations, or our customization layers uh, for your own use cases. Um, lastly, uh, uh, to, to really transform this data into, into action, uh, out-of-the-box apps deliver uh, these use cases that drive immediate value, um, including real-time uh, dashboards, historical reports, rule space trigger for any shop floor data item, and text email notifications that deliver optimized uh, workflows uh, to factory workers. Uh, with machine metrics, uh, uh, manufacturers and machine builders can immediately put their machine data in action while providing the foundation for scaling IoT across their operations. Uh, but enough about us. Uh, let's talk uh, a little bit about um, um, our, our, our special guest, Sandy. Great. Thank you, Graham. Uh, great to uh, connect with all of you here today. Um, you know, it's interesting when I think about fix and I think about equipment as a service, you know, I just think about the transition that, um, you know, us as a, as a software industry uh, really have gone through over the last couple of decades uh, in the transition from on-prem software to software as a service. You know, if you think about uh, players like Salesforce.com, uh, NetSuite, Workday, and really any number of enterprise uh, and business applications that, you know, formerly were on-prem, um, you know, kind of a one-time sale with a uh, perhaps a maintenance contract uh, tied to the back it, back of it, not necessarily user-centric. And and then you know you kind of uh, juxtapose that against uh, you know kind of what what NetSuite and Salesforce did to that space, where they took a user-centric view, software as a service, uh, and, and really transformed um, you know those two categories of of business systems. And you know when I when I think about Fix and I think about what we're doing in the maintenance space. Uh, and really what's happening you know, more broadly um, with industrial software uh, is really a very similar phenomenon where uh, you know, the model is shifting to uh, one that is user-centric, data-centric, um, and as a service. So if we can go to the next slide, Graham, that'd be great. So as we think about our business in the context of this digital transformation and really this transition to as a service, whether that be in software or in other categories such as equipment as we're gonna talk about today, um, you know, really, we focus our business in, in a couple of core areas that we'll highlight here really quickly. Um, you know, just to kind of set the backdrop, you know, when, when we think about, you know, our target customers who are manufacturers like, uh, like many of you, um, first of all, you know, 70 to 80% of them today track uh, and schedule and manage uh, equipment maintenance using paper, pen, and Excel. So really, when, when they deploy fix and customers are looking at fix, they really initially at least, look to get their data into the system. So this is really around uh, tracking assets, managing assets, and so forth. Once you get your data in, then it's about, you know, how do I, how do I work with that data? So executing on work orders, whether it be uh, preventative maintenance, unscheduled maintenance, and so forth. Uh, third category is, you know, how do I get my data out? So how do I understand, you know, what happened in the past? What's currently happening? How do I get a visual view uh, of, uh, of my maintenance operations? And you know, I think Graham's going to talk about this a little bit later, but we really think about, you know, our reporting and analytics, um, you know, really centered around the theme of democratizing uh, access to the data. So, you know, how do you make it as simple as possible to, um, to really view some of this information? 
And then finally, the fourth component, you know, highly relevant to everything we're talking about today is, you know, typically our, our customers, when they deploy Fix, I mean, they're really getting onto software for the first time, looking to um, get a little bit more proactive and preventative with their maintenance programs. But then as they mature, as they evolve, and as sophistication continues to grow, um, you know, really the story becomes, how do we connect systems and processes and data um, between uh, the CMMS uh, to the equipment to business systems so ultimately you can optimize um, you know your overall operations much more effectively if we can move on to the next slide Graham so as we think about you know the journey and you know we can talk about digitization journeys in a number of different ways and you know certainly uh, you know very popular buzzword but very pragmatically the way we think about it in from a maintenance standpoint is is, is this is what you see on the screen here so you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, 70 to 80% of customers today, companies today in manufacturing, they manage maintenance, paper, pen, and Excel. So usually, you know, step one is, how do I get a little bit more preventative, a little bit more proactive? And software is a great tool uh, to really enable you to implement this great strategies that you've likely already built. So really, you know, when you think about software, I kind of think of it in the way, uh, or, you know, through the lens of, you know, really it's a tool to help you execute on uh, your vision, on your strategy. But then as we go up this chain, you know, we begin to start layering in other data elements that allow you to really fine tune the operations. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how that, how that applies in the uh, equipment as a service uh, sort of paradigm. But, you know, as we uh, you know, move up this chain, you know, we, we synchronize and we pull in data from equipment, we can now start to do uh, maintenance based on usage, based on condition, and ultimately, um, you know, get to predictive and prescriptive uh, maintenance activities as well. Uh, next slide, please. So fun fundamentally, you know, how FIX views the world and how we think about FIX, you know, we've been around for 10 years, you know, we were one of, uh, we were the first uh, CMMS that is a software as a service multi-tenant application. And our grounding principles, our grounding philosophy is this, number one, focus on the end user, provide the easiest, simplest to use user interface that's possible. But then number two, really provide all of the um, enterprise capabilities around managing your equipment, managing multiple facilities, managing things like currencies, um, but at the same time having connectivity to both business systems, as you see on the right side of the screen, so your you know, single source of truth in the case of ERPs when it comes to managing things like parts and inventory and your balance sheet and processes and so forth, and then all the way to all of the things we see on the left, which you know, as we're going to talk about today, where you know, you have a great company like Machine Metrics, who's got the ability to connect to equipment, collect data, uh, and then ultimately, you know, FIX ends up being the actual endpoint for uh, all of the data that exists uh, on the shop floor. So um, without further ado, maybe I'll turn it back over to Graham and uh, we, can, uh, we can move forward in the discussion. Yeah, that was awesome, Sandy. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, us at Machine Metrics, we can't help but, you know, it, it immediately see the synergy there. Um, you know, between between systems like these, right? And, um, you know, it's not just about, you know, getting the data and collecting, right? It's, it's about transforming it into into action. Um, and we really appreciate you having uh, having you guys here today to talk about that. Uh, but let's set the stage a little bit for today's conversation. Um, so uh, I like to call this movie rental lessons for a manufacturing world. Uh, back in, in 2000, uh, you know, Netflix founder uh, uh, Reed Hastings, uh, this is a famous story, many of you probably already know, uh, approached, approached uh, Blockbuster CEO John and Tioko uh, and, and, and asked for 50 million bucks, right, to give away Netflix. And, uh, you know, Blockbuster, right, thinking this is a very, you know, small niche business, uh, uh, you know, said, you know, you know, we don't need you, right? Uh, uh, at the time, it was just a DVD mailing service, actually. Um, and, well, we all kind of know how this story plays out, right? Uh, Blockbuster goes bust. Netflix, right, becomes the billion-dollar king of video in the world uh, of, of modern uh, content consumption, right? It is changed, you know, forever. Um, so what does that look like, right, other, in other, you know, other business worlds, right? Well, we know that the manufacturing space, right, is, is, is in many ways, uh, you know, siloed as, you know, more blockbuster than Netflix, if you will, right? And that's where companies like Machine Metrics, right, and Fix, right, are, that's kind of the whole, the, the principle behind us, right? But, um, um, you know, uh, in, it, you have people, you have machinery, you have broken processes, and like blockbuster, right, you know, traditional manufacturing operates under a more legacy model, right? It requires a lot more time, effort, 
manual labor and waste, um, you know, traditional equipment procurement, right, assumes this long life cycle um, with, you know, you know, uh, decreasing equipment conditions, um, you know, all phases of the business are geared to support that legacy model, right? Um, and that leads to inefficiencies, uh, uh, diminishing returns, data silos, um, you know, as a proposed solution, right, you have these kind of generic IoT platforms uh, that have, you know, have had struggles with, for manufacturing that lead to high rates of failure, it's something we talk about a lot in our other, um, our other um, webinars and, and, even, and, and even even more difficult is that you know everybody wants to kind of build their own solution right and and that that too leads to its own uh problems but you know because of these things right the current state of manufacturing remains the largest industry in the world with the least digitization right so uh, enter what sandy said right the democratization of, of machine data right this you know uh, it turns out that more people than ever, right, can use the data that is collected thanks to new connected systems, IoT, um, at any time to make decisions, right, with no barriers, right, or access uh, to understanding. And with that, you know, it starts at the manufacturing level, but we see it opening up, right, uh, a world of new business models, enhanced communications, connected ecosystems, and frankly, uh, just a more resilient economy of the future uh, based upon uh, on data and, and, and connectivity. Um, so, so the result is really an industry, right, uh, as a service, right? And we're gonna talk about equipment and service as a piece of that, but, um, but Sandy, you know, um, you know, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen a little bit and we're gonna, you know, head right into the, um, Discussion component. You know what is you know what is uh, you know manufacturing as a service mean to you? Yeah, that's a great question, Graham. I mean, you know, when I think about as a service models, right? And I I always go back to you know what is what's the current state, right? And kind of the way I see current state is you know you sell a piece of equipment, expensive piece of equipment, you know capex um, for the customer, uh, and really a one-time revenue stream for for the builder. And when we think about you know as a service. Um, you know, to me, there's just so many more efficiencies to gain on both sides of that equation when we think about it as a service. So more value um, for, the, for the end customer, for the manufacturer, um, in terms of, uh, you know, the efficiencies gained, uh, perhaps lower costs uh, as well over the long term, uh, and then vice versa. So, you know, when we think about a machine builder, rather than having a single revenue stream that's highly, uh, potentially cyclical, as we're seeing right now, where, you know, capital expenditures are down across the board, um, you know, really, there's an opportunity to um, really forge, you know, what, what we like to think about in the, in the software space uh, around, uh, you know, a long-term partnership with clients. So it's really not a, a one-and-done uh, transactional model, but rather it's a, you know, hey, let's, uh, let's embark on this journey together. Um, you know, we've got, uh, we've got this, uh, this asset, if you will, or this equipment uh, that we can, um, we can work with you on and help you ultimately drive your ultimate business objectives uh, and work with you along that process. So very much a, a long-term partnership, not a one and done. To me, a uh, tremendous opportunity for uh, a win-win, uh, you know, as we see in, uh, in other categories. You know, we certainly see that all the time uh, in the software world. Yeah, it's funny, you know, we obviously come from a software background. So SaaS is, you know, SaaS, PaaS, information architecture is a service, right? It's nothing new, right? And, and for manufacturing, right? You know, uh, the legacy business models, at least that we've seen, you know, are, you know, you sell a machine, right? You sell a part. Um, you know, you, you manufacture a part, right? And, and, and the, the way that this, the models, right, the systems kind of were built was because to support that type of model, right? And as, you know, you know, at least kind of riffing off what you were saying, right, is that, you know, economic variance, right? And, you know, which, which happens all the time, right? Leads to, you know, different, different behavior, right? And, and, and different necessities, you know, you can see how, um, you know, either, you know, subscription models, usage-based models offer a lot of value, uh, between both, especially right, given uh, you know a time, as you said, when it's 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 much harder to justify you know upfront capital, right, for for certain things, and you know the, you know it's funny because the logic right says well of course right as service models right uh, you know I I remember being at a convention when I was you know um, doing my classic spiel and oh my god the manufacturer we're moving to this space right and 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 a gentleman from another space is well we've had as a service models for 15 years. You know, wh 
why why now right for manufacturing right what is it about like the current landscape that makes it you know i guess uh you know uh, ready to finally be realized you know in your experience? yeah so you know i i just love the parallel with software right like in software in many cases it, it's been easy because uh the unit costs are virtually nothing when, when we think about software as a service when you're selling equipment as a service you've got a whole bunch of different considerations where you know there's 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 investment there's actual hardware there's cost you know there's unit costs that you've got to uh, bear in mind and to me what changes the game is the access to the data uh, is the industrial internet of things right because now you can very in a very um, detailed manner you can understand and you can partner with customers in my opinion, to really understand what value is the equipment driving, what business outcomes are you producing, uh, and then from there you can you can derive a, a business model that really makes sense for both parties. In the past, when you didn't have access to real time data, you didn't have necessarily the computing power to process that data in real time in a in a manner that allowed you to optimize. Um, you know, a business model is what we're talking about. Um, it was very difficult to really understand. Okay, what is my what does my as a service model look like? You know, if I'm looking at usage, if I'm looking at time, if I'm looking at um, end revenue that uh, ultimately gets produced downstream, um, you know, to me, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. You know, the data uh, and the ability to process that data and process that data very quickly, and of course, share that data with other systems um, is, uh, you know, is the absolute ultimate game changer, uh, especially when you're thinking about, you know, the, the equipment as a service. I mean, just to go off on a slight tangent, I mean, as we're thinking about, you know, as a service. I mean, GE did it with their GE 90 uh, aircraft engines, uh, you know, gosh, it would have been decades ago now. Obviously, you know, in that application, you know, what was the consistent theme? They had access to the data. They were able to understand uh, the value of, uh, of the run hours associated with that engine given certain conditions. That's so true. And, you know, when you think about, you know, you know, I guess industrial revolutions, right, generally, right, they, they seem to change uh, uh, at the intersection of right, a few kind of specific you know, reasons, right? You know, either, you know, new, new technologies kind of arise that are, you know, present, you know, better solutions to people's problems, right? Or maybe, you know, people change, right? In a way that presents, uh, you know, uh, new problems that require different solutions, right? And those solutions are often enabled through new technology or uh, the economy, right? Changes uh, in a way that necessitates, right? That, that reinvention of how people, and technology will solve these problems. And uh, oftentimes I think it's a bit of all three and many times the latter, right? The economic, uh, 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 you know, change, you know, is a catalyst for the former two. And, you know, in this situation that we have today, at least the way that we see it, right? Um, you know, you have, uh, you know, an era of, you know, tremendous economic change, right? Um, and, and people are, are looking at their businesses, you know, in new ways, right? But we're also seeing the, the rise of IoT, right? This new technology exists. Um, you know, we still see that manufacturing, right? And its ecosystem is, you know, you know, low in adoption, right? Uh, but but people, right, and the way that we're in, uh, we're, we're interacting with these ecosystems are also changing, right? And and they have to more than ever given the current scenario. So you know, it's almost like the the holy trinity, if you will, of, of, of change moments seem to be when those, those three things come together as that catalyst uh, for the two. Um, now, um, obviously, you know, there are obvious advantages, right, to systems like these. But, um, you know, uh, I like how, Andy, uh, I love, Sandy, that you started with the manufacturer, right? Uh, you know, uh, what's the value, right, to the, the end use manufacturer when, you know, you have as a service, systems right um you know feel free to take that and i'll, and I'll follow you all right perfect um <laughs> yeah this is fun so um yeah a couple couple of things i mean i guess we can start with kind of the obvious ones right um you know lower barrier to entry if i'm a manufacturer now i don't have to go out and you know procure um capital capital um so i can buy buy equipment and take on that risk um, you know, certainly less risk uh, to me to, to be able to jump in and get started. So, you know, tremendous benefit from, from that standpoint. But if we look at it over the long term where, you know, you compare what happened if I bought equipment today versus what if, what if I did, you know, a, an equipment as a service model, you know, Bain and company did a, did a study uh, late in 2019. Um, you know, some of you may have seen it, but really they estimated around a 15% um, reduction in overall 
total cost of ownership over a period of time um, in an equipment as a service model for an end manufacturer. And really the efficiencies gained um, you know, are around, uh, you know, you're sharing the, the depreciation, your, um, you know, presumably your, your equipment's going to be maintained more effectively, more efficiently, uh, and those, those cost savings get passed downstream uh, to the manufacturer. So, you know, as you think about a manufacturer, I mean, uh, you know, who, who doesn't prefer uh, less risk and lower costs, right? Usually, uh, usually it's the other way around, but, um, you know, to me, that, that, that's kind of what drives it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, 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 you know, when you think about it, right, um, you know, just in the, in the terms of, of predictive maintenance, just for example, right. And, you know, obviously you're, you're in maintenance. We collect all this data from these machines as well. Right. Um, you know, um, many times I think um, the siloing of, of data oftentimes will, will lead to a deceleration of, of the ability to enable or even, you know, achieve uh, the benefits of, you know, uh, maintenance optimization due to the aggregate amounts of data, right? Oftentimes, um, you know, companies will kind of get stuck in those, those early phases of, you know, how do we even deliver, uh, how do we even get the data, right? What does that even mean, right? Uh, versus maybe even a focus on kind of like what they do, right? What, what is it that we do and about our machines and how do we, um, you know, kind of like lay over our expertise to deliver you know, an application or a as a service value back to the manufacturer. And I think, you know, through the 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 simplification, right, of of IoT enablement, right, the ability to start aggregating, capturing that data very easily, uh, you know, the you know, the end use, right, is just, well, you can use your equipment more because it doesn't break as much, right? Um, right. Uh, you know, but I think, you know, you start thinking about it in, in a couple other ways. Um, and 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 you know, you say, well, Let's talk about today's world, right? You're in, um, you're in, you're in COVID times, right? You, your factory is locked down, right? Uh, you know, some factories may may be letting people in. Many of our customers are not, right? So, and you have a machine, right, that goes down, right? And and oftentimes, right, the legacy model would be well, you send out a technician, right? Sometimes you might even have to, you know, pay, right, <laughs> if it's you know a post warranty period, right, to get that technician on site. Right, um, you know, through IoT enablement, right, through 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 selling kind of like a more of an as a service model, right, remote service seems to be one of those like first use cases that present huge value, right, to the to the manufacturers that like you know I can get faster service on my machine, right, and I don't have to wait, um, you know, and, and certainly in times like this, you can you know we're at least hearing that that's a a use case that that tends to drive some some pretty significant value. Um, so I think, um, you know, and then on the other side, right, um, you know, you have, um, um, we're getting some great questions coming in, everybody. So I'm going to, I'll do my best to, to bring those in um, uh, as, as we get along, right? But um, for the provider, right, you know, you have, you know, it's not just the machine builder, although today that's kind of our focus today. We're talking about machine builders and machine providers, but, um, you know, what's the benefits to, to companies like, like them, right? I mean, obviously happy customer, right? But you know, um, when you're looking at like a uh, revenue models, for example, or service models, you know, what are, where are your first thoughts? Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting concept when you look at that pie, right? Like you, you kind of have that, that total, uh, total cost of ownership pie where, uh, you know, the, the end customer uh, of the, or the user of that equipment um, you know, ends up having expenditures. We talked a little bit about, uh, you know, up to a 15% savings um, in that overall pie, but what this affords the the OEM is uh, the opportunity to generate revenue um, from other categories in that pie, rather than that you know upfront sale, uh, perhaps. So you know, kind of where 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 we go immediately, of course, is uh, on the service side. So you know, maintenance. Um, you know, being able to um, generate uh, revenue from from the maintenance of that equipment, uh, highly valuable. Um, but also efficiencies are gained, right? Because presumably the builder of that equipment will have more intimate knowledge of what needs to be done given certain conditions, given certain use cases, given certain data that's coming off of that equipment. So again, win-win uh, in that category, certainly, you know, revenue going to the builder, cost saving being passed on to the end customer. Uh, same goes for um, aftermarket parts. So as parts uh, need to get replaced, uh, you know, opportunity to, to drive uh, an increase uh, in uh, in revenue on that side as well. So, you know, kind of going back to that that same study that uh, that I was quoting earlier. You know, we're we're thinking about 15% savings uh, for the uh, for the end manufacturer. Um, for the machine builder, you know, anywhere between 25 and 50% uh, 
um, opportunity for increased revenue um, through the as-a-service model over time, um, as opposed to, you know, kind of the, the, the traditional, um, you know, capital expenditure uh, sort of equipment sale. Yeah, and, and that, that actually, that, I love that response, and, and I, I love that Bain study also, um, and uh, almost got them to join us on this webinar, but just too short notice. But, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, um, I think, you know, one of the things that we're, I'm hearing a lot, I'm getting a lot of questions around this, right, is, is kind of like uh, the shift in, 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 I guess they're saying a shift in risk, right? So, um, right, so you have, um, you know, obviously like as a service models are, are entering, you know, every industry that at least I'm, you know, involved with um, and, and manufacturing, you know, is next to come, right? But, um, you know, equipment as a service, machining as a service, uh, more often associated with like a usage-based model, right? Where the machine is used um, and it's kind of pay as you go. Um, you know, but um, when I think about this, uh, and I, I loved your uh, your diagram, uh, which is kind of like a, a journey, if you will. Um, you know, if the future, right, or, or or today, right, is is machine as service, equipment as service. You know, where, where are like the starting points, right, for for manufacturers to go along their journey? Because to me, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that today, right, you need to start with no upfront costs sales anymore, right? Or, um, or you know, full usage-based models, right? Um, you, know, um, you know, where are some use cases today that through IoT enablement manufacturers could get started with um, just by having access to data that might, uh, you know, kind of begin their journey from, you know, today's model to maybe like the future model of, of EAS? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. I mean, I'll go to my I'll go to my pet uh, theme here, which is uh, you know maintenance uh, maintenance contracts uh, parts, um, you know aftermarket parts sales. Um, you know, simple ways. Uh, you know, I think I see the question in the chat right uh, about shifting the risk. Simple ways to really start to convert that revenue stream, convert the model without undertaking undue risk up front. Right. I think you know I think we both acknowledge Graham that. You know, you, you can't you can't make the shift overnight. Um, you know, far too risky. I think um, you know the business models. Um, you know, st still uh, opportunities to to refine. I think you know it very much is that journey of you know uh, starting small, thinking big. Um, you know, and failing fast. I mean, I, I just love I love personally that uh, that methodology. So that uh, you know you've got the opportunity to really um, try out some of these models, see how it works for the customer. Ultimately. Um, you know, when the, when the, when the value is created, um, you know, the model, uh, will, will be an output of, you know, how that pie gets, uh, how that pie gets split up. Yeah. We, we see a very kind of similar model, right. Where, um, you know, kind of the, um, uh, if you're on the, like, uh, the, the roadmap, right. To manufacturing analytics, the roadmap to automation, right. You know, I guess the end goal maybe is, you know, you have, you know, automated systems in the factory or where, whether it's, you know, machines adapt themselves, you know, tools reorder themselves, right? Uh, uh, materials reorder, right? This is kind of these, you know, uh, these, these, these models driven by data, right? And, uh, but, you know, where is that starting point, right? Um, you know, for us, um, you know, we, we like to call it you know, more, you know, descriptive analytics, which tends to just be what's, you know, what's happening today, right? And, um, you know, through IoT enablement of equipment, right? And starting to, aggregate and understand uh, those pain points oftentimes will help lead to, um, you know, a better understanding of well, what, what do our customers need, right? So um, I always think that when you're trying to go to market with a, with a product or a, or a new business model, you don't necessarily want to lead just with because it's a new business model, right? You want to, you want to identify the problem, right? And, um, you know, in the, in the problem today, right, if you have market variants, right, people stop, stop buying things, right? So, um, you know, just as service models in, in, in and of their nature, right, are, you know, reoccurring subscription models, um, right? And, and those, those are, are, you know, much more palatable during those economic variants, right? But, um, you know, some of the other use cases that, that we're seeing um, is, uh, you know, anything from just, you know, like I said, reduction of service costs, right, through, through remote service or, uh, you know, the ability to, uh, you know, to optimize a preventative maintenance plan, right, for a machine based on, the usage that a, that a customer uses the machine, right? And this is something that we hear all the time from 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 the manufacturer, right? Is that you know um, you know the preventive maintenance plans that comes with a machine, right? It's it's entirely based on you know almost always based on just 
the calendar, right? And, and, and you know, whereas a usage-based model might even be more effective, but, you know, maybe that's step one, right? But, um, you know, even, you know, the next step in that, that analytics journey might be, well, what does your usage model look like? And how do you use your machines, right? What type of materials do you use? What type of tools, right? Uh, what, what, what type of parts are you making, right? And I think by um, collecting data, and, and better understanding the use cases of the customer, um, this is really where the, the value, right, in, in IoT enablement and, 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 and the opportunity comes within models like this, I think, is to, is to better individualize, right, and provide more unique uh, adaptive services to the manufacturer. More as a statement. <laughs> um, we are getting into all sorts of questions, so you guys will uh, you guys will have to forgive me um, as I as I take these on as we go. Um, you know, we're going to save some of them for the Q and A section, so just uh, uh, forgive me. Uh, what, uh, Sandy? Given that we have so many questions, um, you know, I figured maybe it makes sense for us, um, you know, just to very quickly kind of roll through the use cases that we've at least uh, you know that we're focused on enabling, and right. let's just get right to the questions because um, that's really the best part. Um, you know, so just kind of coming back to our, our slide deck here, for those of you who can see us, uh, you know, for machine metrics, right, we really see uh, that, that connection kind of visualized here, right, between, um, you know, the, the consumer, right, which at the end tends to be the, you know, oftentimes is the, the you know, the manufacturer, right, uh, you have manufacturer one, manufacturer two, right, if you can combine and aggregate data from, from all sorts of assets in the field, uh, from individual sites, uh, make that data available, right, to, um, you know, to the OEMs, right, you can better understand uh, the usage um, by those manufacturers of your equipment, right, and having real-time access to customers' machine data, uh, what we're seeing, at least for our customers, it, it immediately reduces service costs, right, um, real-time data without ac the necessity of accessing the customer's VPN, uh, one of the big pain points that we've heard from a number number of our of our of our OEM machine builder partners is just that the manufacturer may not want you to to hop right on their their network right and 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 or even leverage their internal Wi-Fi right so you know machine metrics edge devices we sell them with with uh, you know cellular right so you can IoT enable the piece of equipment and then the moment it lands on the customer site um, and turns on. Uh, you know, that data can then immediately be streamed back to, uh, you know, the, the, the service team or the machine builder or the distributor, right, um, in real time, right? And, um, you know, this has been used in a number of use cases, whether it be, you know, um, you know, just a machine runoff example, right, where a customer wants to, you know, prove one part can be made on one machine versus another. Um, our customers have been able to leverage this data in real time uh, in order to do so. Uh, not exactly as a service, right? But it's, um, you know, it's more IoT enablement. Um, you know, but once you start collecting that data over long periods of time, you can start, um, you know, driving new opportunities. For example, um, you know, what are the most reoccurring alarms on whose machines, right? And how do we uh, deliver solutions, whether it be through automation or through, you know, instructions, right? Back, you know, to the machine, right? Or to the operator, right? So they can, they can solve those problems, right? In real time or even predictively or, um, you know, if we capture enough data, right? And one of the things that machine metrics does is we collect high frequency data directly from the control of the machine. Um, so we're able to visualize, um, you know, ver very, uh, you know, um, microsecond, millisecond um, data that's coming off the control relative to the tooling, for example. Um, you can leverage that data as a tooling provider, as a, as a machining provider, um, to, to, to deliver right, your own predictive models uh, to machine metrics edge devices um, uh, based on you know, your, your, your own conception, right, your own uh, deep domain knowledge of your machines and those risks associated based on the data that we're collecting. So um, you know, it represents a fast track, for example, to predictive uh, maintenance solutions for those that aren't trying to rebuild the wheel from scratch. Uh, you know, some of our customers have satisfied insurance claims, right, even with the data that we're collecting, right, and, and you can see how that's like an almost like an, an obvious use case uh, in, in the future. Um, but even more so, you know, you're looking at product design. Uh, you know, how do we make a better machine? Which machines are being used best by the manufacturer, right? How do we access all that history to, uh, uh, so we can deliver, uh, you know, a better service or a better machine in the future? 
Um, so these are just, again, some of the use cases that we're seeing, um, you know, and, and that can obviously be extrapolated out to, you know, um, some of the things that Sandy was uh, alluding to earlier, uh, you know, how do you, uh, you know, feed other elements of the supply chain with that machine data? You know, it's not just the machine builder, right, that requires data from machines, right? You may have tooling providers, grinding wheel providers, uh, you know, materials providers, parts providers, and being able to understand and, and, and aggregate data on consumption and use, right, uh, on, on the shop floor can help drive uh, faster, better decisions that can lead to, you know, a more efficient, more resilient uh, supply chain in the future. Uh, but it can also help you augment and, and align uh, that supply chain based on actual customer demands and not necessarily based on, uh, you know, gut feel, right, which is how many of the use cases that we've seen, uh, you know, in the past uh, run. Um, but uh, I'll also pass it over to Sandy so he can share some of his and then we can get right into the questions. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so tie, kind of tie it together. I mean, you know, if I had to think about this in a bit of a, a framework here, right? So everything Graham talked about was about, you know, c connecting to the equipment, collecting the data, performing analysis. And when it comes to fix, it's really about taking action on that data. So what do we do with that information? So we talked earlier, right? Like our application, mobile optimized, technician focused, multi-tenant, multi-site, um, you're really optimized for use by the maintenance team. We integrate um, you know, incredibly well with uh, ERP and other business systems. But when it comes to the shop floor, you know, as, we're, as we're thinking about you know, what do we do with the data, it's really about taking action um, on the data that is, uh, that is being collected um, at the equipment level. So very simple use case is you know, making the shift from a time-based uh, PM program to a usage-based uh, PM program. You know, we see customers all the time uh, implement this strategy and um, you know, their cost savings are, are palpable. So, um, you know, it could be, you know, saving 1 p.m. per month per equipment because now they're performing p.m.s based on the actual throughput rather than, um, you know, an arbitrary uh, time-based schedule. So, you know, tremendous opportunity. And as, you know, more data gets collected and analyzed and we have more information around um, the, the condition and the history of the asset, we can get, uh, you know, even more precise around, you know, when equipment should be, uh, should be maintained based on its health, based on, you know, the slightest degradation of performance. Um, so that ultimately we can, um, you know, we can really minimize the amount of time, uh, both unplanned, of course, uh, as well as planned uh, downtime. So really in a nutshell, kind of the way we think about fix and we think about our strategy is, you know, how do we help you to take action um, on your equipment based on, actual information and actual data uh, that's being generated and collected and analyzed so that ultimately we can drive better availability, better performance, and as an output, better quality uh, off the line. Awesome. Yeah, now we obviously we've got all sorts of questions coming in. So we're going to do our best to get to all of these. Um, um, so uh, the first question, uh, I knew this one was going to come, uh, you know, is there any connection uh, between fix and machine metrics, uh, real-time data to optimize supply chain? Uh, you know, Sandy, uh, obviously, um, you know, we, we do, today we don't have an out-of-the-box integration, you know, machine metrics, you know, we're API based, um, you know, webhook based, you know, so we can integrate with any system. I assume that's the same with fix. Open um, API. Yeah. Super straightforward. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's it's quite 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 simple. Good idea, though, anonymous attendee. We'll we'll take we'll we'll get on that one later. Um, question actually for you, Sandy. Uh, you know, what is your opinion about selling special design machines on the machine and service uh, model basis? Yeah, I mean, I think I think ultimately, you know, I, I I tend to be pretty pragmatic when it comes to these uh, these types of conversations. Ultimately, you know, is uh, is the model does the model work for for you and for um, for the end client, right? Like, have, you know, Graham, you talked earlier, right? Like usage-based, um, time-based, production-based, like there's so many different permutations for uh, ultimately how you take, uh, you know, take the model uh, to market. So, you know, I think if, uh, if the inputs line up, then um, I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to, to really be disruptive um, and take advantage of, uh, you know, the, the first mover advantage that typically applies anytime, you know, there are these fundamental shifts uh, in the business, right? We see it across the board, across industries. We see it in software, um, and I have no doubt we'll we'll see a similar phenomenon um, when it comes to equipment as a service as well. Yeah, I agree. And 
Um, you know, uh, this is a question, I guess, for us, uh, what type of data, uh, the data points are collected via PLC and other parts? Uh, you know, well, that, that question obviously depends on the type of equipment, right? So machine metrics, you know, are, uh, we have an automated uh, data tag mapping system, right? So um, when we plug into a machine and we've connected to, you know, like I said, you know, thousands of machines across hundreds of, of sites, um, you know, we automatically map out and tag those various data points based on, uh, you know, our experience with machine types like that. Um, you know, so, you know, depending on the type of machine, it could be hundreds of data points, anything from loads, feed, speeds, rotary velocities, diagnostic PMC parameters, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, we can go all the way down, uh, you know, to the, some of the, the, anything that's on the control itself. Um, and then we can actually add additional sensors, um, you know, for, for whether it's a legacy machine or, you know, if you're trying to, you know, uh, draw current sensor data, uh, vibration data as well, not just from the control. Um, you know, but we find that, um, you know, if you're able to collect data uh, directly from the control it represents the most uh, scalable and um, cost effective and frankly, um, uh, just uh, most logical place to pull data from because it's, it's the most accurate and you can also collect it at a much higher frequency. Um, whereas, uh, you know, sensors, you know, time consuming, somewhat tedious and, you know, are sometimes less uh, you know, external sensor set as less, um, you know, less accurate. Um, so um, let's see, um, we have, I'm just trying to sift through these, so bear with me, everybody. Um, you know, let's see, what ideas uh, have we seen um, for OEMs to capture the opportunity of having equipment? You know, so usage-based models can be scary, right? This is from, from Sean. Uh, as the OEM, uh, you know, since a, a customer may run into, uh, uh, may run at a, a planned utilization. That's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're, you know, say selling a machine, right, at a certain cost, right, and then now you're, you know, you're pricing the machine instead based on a, in a, in a planned utilization model, um, you know, does that represent real risk to, to the OEM? You know, my, I guess my gut, you know, my initial reaction to that um, is, is I think it's all around uh, the value that can be provided through that model, right? So, um, while you may be correct, right, that some, you know, there are some initial fears that can come through, um, you know, a purely usage-based model. And again, I think um, part of what Sandy and I are are kind of uh, presented today is not that usage-based models are fully here for manufacturing, but more that um, you know, all other major industries have headed in that direction, um, but, um, you know, it kind of starts with early, uh, you know, uh, use case that drive value with data, both for the manufacturer and then to the equipment provider. Um, um, but, um, yeah, so I think that um, you can see that it's all around the, the other value, right? So it's not just the usage, but what other value can you drive in that data, both for yourselves and for the customer? I think that that delivers auxiliary business models. Sandy, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I think anytime we see this transition, there's, there's always going to be that initial, you know, period of uneasiness where, you know, you're going to have this inflection point where initially, you know, yes, there's going to be that upfront cost um, in the case of the OEM where, you know, the early revenues may not quite, um, may not quite, uh, you know, kind of give you that, that early return. Like there, there needs to be buy-in across um, the company, right? And I don't think we got into the, the topic of culture, right? But all mm. the way from customer support to the investors to the executives, like, you know, are we going to commit to a different model? And if so, you know, th there will be the early stages of transition that, uh, you know, will have its own challenges. But over the long run, in particular, when you factor in first mover advantage, um, you know, I think the concept in the market's called uh, swallowing the fish, right? Where, you know, the you hit that inflection point and then, you know, your, your revenues far exceed the cost and you've got, you know, an established model in place, one that works uh, for all the stakeholders, which, you know, I, I don't think I can stress that uh, enough, right? Ultimately, is the model right. efficient um, for all parties? And then, um, then the payoff uh, ends up being uh, quite positive. Yeah, I agree. And um, here's a good one, uh, you know, which is, you know, somewhat on topic to what we're talking about right now. Um, you know, uh, uh, some uh, Nick is curious how machine OEMs are engaging, you know, equipment as service today, right? Uh, you know, on the leasing or selling of their capital equipment. And, you know, I would just preface this by saying that, you know, uh, very few uh, manufacturing, you know, machine tool providers that I know of have fully moved 
to either a, a, a full leasing or, or um, EAS model. Uh, but that said, I know that, you know, again, and many of our customers, because, you know, and, and Sandy can speak this too, are, are building kind of the groundwork, right? And, you know, we call it the foundation, right? And, uh, you know, in order to build that foundation, right, you need to be able to, um, you know, have, um, you know, that data collection component, the data transformation, uh, you know, the ability to, you know, sell a machine, actually get the data back so you can, you can leverage it, right? And that requires, you know, a platform, if you will, to do so, um, you know, something like a machine metrics or something else uh, in that instance, um, you know, and then, um, you know, we do have customers right now, uh, uh, machine distributors that are, are tying, you know, for example, like the sales of, of, of you know, extended warranties, right, and, and, and prevented maintenance plans. Uh, based on uh, their customers' usage of the machines or even previous uh, history of usage, right? So uh, you can kind of see how uh, in many times they're, they're building kind of like a foundation for a, a credit-based model to some extent, right? Of, you know, machine usage where, you know, if you use your machines well, right, you can, you know, get better financing models, right? And then you can extend warranties if you, if you do the preventative maintenance is scheduled, right? So that, I think that symbiosis actually um, is, is an answer to one of our previous questions to some extent where it's like, um, you know, what's the value, right? It's like, well, you can, if you can capture the data and you can deliver those, those models, right? Those preventative maintenance plans directly to the machine and have that proof, Right, um, you know, then you, you have the opportunity for uh, a number of of you know sales, um, you know, tangential to or within that initial sale of the machine uh, that presents you know stronger revenue models. Um, I don't know if you had any other thoughts on that, uh, Sandy. Well, I don't know. I kind of I like the baseball analogy, right? And uh, I don't know if there's any baseball fans uh, on the line here, but. Um, you know, when, when big data, um, you know, kind of took hold of baseball 20 years ago, people kind of thought the Oakland A's were, were nuts, right? I'm just kind of stealing from, from Moneyball here, right? But, um, you know, clearly, you know, over the last 20 years, we've seen kind of the fruits of that transition that started from, from a very few uh, in the early days to pretty much every organization today kind of employing it. And, um, you know, I see, I, see, I see a very similar phenomenon happening as we speak uh, in the industrial space. Every customer I talk to, and uh, you know, they're they're in the midst of laying the foundation for um, this this transformation and um, really new models and new ways of doing things. So, um, you know, while I think we are kind of in the in the earlier phases, um, the foundation is being laid. I'm seeing it all the time, um, and uh, you know, the, the the models the models make sense. Um, it's uh, it's just something that uh, you know we're we're in that uh, we're in that period of uh, of, sh of shift. Um, yeah, I love the Billy Bean analogy. So true, right? Uh, you know, people that are and people today even still think they're crazy, right? Uh, you know, to run to run models like that, right? Yet, you know, every you know baseball team kind of you know does their you know their drafting and you know all based on stats now. Um, that's a great point. Uh, uh, another quick question on this: uh, you know, do machine metrics and fix partner on the shop floor? Uh, and hand in hand for a full solution. Uh, to answer that, I would say, uh, you know, reach out to Machine Metrics, you know, myself or Sandy, and, and we can we can talk to you about, um, you know, um, you know what that would look like for your for your operation. Um, you know, and, and and for that, you know, um, we're kind of like winding down to the end here, so I, I don't want to keep anybody too long. Um, I just wanted to say that we really enjoyed the conversation. Um, we're really thankful to have Sandy here. Uh, with us from Fix, um, you know, I think that you know. Again, we love we love to to talk about the future. Uh, we also love even more to talk about what you can do today, right, to lay the foundation and drive value for that future. Um, so um, we've really appreciated your your uh, your insights, and we're thankful to have had you. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Hopefully, everybody uh, found this insightful. Um, yeah, we we love uh, we we love thinking about the future. Uh, with the realization that, uh, you know, to begin, uh, begin, uh, as, as a wise man once told me, right? So start small, think big, move fast. Um, and, uh, you know, any way uh, we can be of support, uh, we'd love to, uh, uh, to assist. Yeah, so keep, out, keep an eye out. We're going to be doing a number of other uh, webinars over the next couple months. So we'll be rehashing our uh, seemingly more popular by the, by the week, the state of the industries, which are, you know, continuing to come with more unique, interesting data. 
So, uh, so um, feel free to reach out to either Sandy or myself if you have any other questions. Uh, otherwise, we hope you all have a lovely day and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.